Okay, hello and welcome. My name is Amy Royer and I'm the project coordinator of the Rural Health Initiative. The mission of RHI is to engage partners to share ideas and expertise and to support communities improving health while stimulating a higher level of wellness across the state. Thank you all for joining us today for our webinar, You Are the Key to Cancer to HPV Cancer Prevention, presented by Emily Coyle with the American Cancer Society. I'll go over a couple of technical details before we get started. Everyone has been set to mute. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please use the chat box function on the right of your screen. We will address those at the end of the presentation. Make sure if you use the chat box to select whether the comments can be seen by all participants. Otherwise, I will be the only one allowed to read them. And once the webinar is over, you have an opportunity to provide valuable feedback through a brief survey. So please take time to fill that out for us. It's very helpful. It will automatically pop up on your screen once you're complete. So thank you again for joining us. I'll roll the ball over to Emily and she can get started. Okay, you're good to go. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so good afternoon. As Amy said, my name is Emily Coyle and I am the State Health Systems Manager for the American Cancer Society here in Montana. I uh, first want to thank Amy for inviting me to present You Are the Key to Cancer Prevention. The American Cancer Society has received funding from the CDC, which developed this presentation to launch a nationwide campaign in partnership with the CDC and other organizations to eliminate HPV-related cancers through increased vaccination. And part of those efforts include provider education and public health training. So thank you all for joining today. When this presentation is complete, you should be able to first describe why HPV vaccination is important for cancer prevention. Uh, second, to identify the appropriate HPV vaccination schedule based on patient age. Uh, third, describe effective HPV vaccine recommendations for patients age 11 or 12 years old, as well as for age 13 years and older. Uh, fourth, to develop self-efficacy in delivering HPV vaccination recommendations. Uh, fifth, to identify reassuring, confident, and concise responses to parental questions about HPV vaccination. Uh, and sixth, to implement disease detection and prevention healthcare services to prevent health problems and maintain health. So we'll jump right in. Uh, this first section will focus on HPV infection and disease prevalence to give you all some background. So human papillomaviruses, HPV, are a very common family of viruses that infect epithelial tissue. HPV types differ in their tendency to infect cutaneous and mucosal or genital epithelium. More than 150 HPV types have been identified, including approximately 40 that infect the genital area. Genital HPV types are categorized according to their epidemiologic association with cervical cancer. High-risk types, such as type 16 and 18, can cause low-grade cervical cell abnormalities, high-grade cervical cell abnormalities that are precursors to cancer and cancers. In addition to cervical cancer, HPV infection also is the cause of some cancers of the vulva, vagina, penis, and anus, as well as cancer of the oropharynx. Low-risk types, like six, and 11, like 6 and 11, can cause benign or low-grade cervical cell changes, genital warts, and recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. Most HPV infections happen during the teen and college aged years because HPV infection usually occurs soon after sexual debut. Most people never know they've been infected. Um, women may find out they're infected because of an abnormal pap test with a positive HPV test or a diagnosis of genital warts. And men may find out because of a genital warts diagnosis as well. So this slide here shows the numbers that were displayed in the figure in the previous slide. And it focuses in on the number of cancers that are attributable to HPV per year in the U.S. from 2009 to 2013. Um, and what that means is an HPV attributable cancer is a cancer probably caused by HPV. So the column with percentage probably caused by any HPV type comes from the CDC genotyping studies. Um, HPV causes nearly all cervical cancers and many cancers of the vagina, vulva, penis, anus, and oropharynx. Um, but since rectal cancer was not included in the CDC genotyping study, the HPV attributable fraction for anal cancer was used because recent studies show that the HPV-associated types of anal and rectal cancer are similar. 
Uh, the CDC estimated that during 2009 to 2013, HPV caused about 31,500 cancers in the U.S. each year with 19,400 cancers in women and 12,100 cancers in men. Most HPV-associated cancers in women were cervical cancers, while in men most were oral pharyngeal cancers. So this next section will focus on HPV vaccine recommendations. All available prophylactic HPV vaccines are made from virus-like particles. The vaccines do not contain any, contain any viral DNA and therefore are non-infectious and cannot cause actual disease or cancer. HPV vaccines produce a better immune response than an HPV infection. So this chart demonstrates the HPV types targeted by each HPV vaccine. Bivalent HPV vaccines target two types of HPV, quadrivalent HPV vaccines target four types of HPV, and nivalent HPV vaccines target nine types of HPV. Bivalent, quadrivalent, and nivalent HPV vaccines all protect against HPV 16 and 18, the types that cause about two-thirds of cervical cancers and the majority of other HPV attributable cancers in the U.S. Quadrivalent and nine-valent HPV vaccine also protect against HPV 6 and 11, HPV types that cause genital warts. In addition, nine-valent HPV vaccine targets five additional cancer-causing types, which account for another 15% of cervical cancers. Um, the additional five types in nine-valent HPV vaccine account for a higher proportion of HPV-associated cancers in women compared with men and also cause cervical precancers in women. All three vaccines are still licensed in the U.S., however, after the end of 2016, um, only nine-valent HPV vaccine is currently being marketed in the U.S. So while clinical trial data show HPV vaccine has high efficacy for prevention of several of the HPV-associated precancers in addition to cervical precancers, no clinical trial data are available to demonstrate efficacy per, per, for prevention of oropharyngeal or penile cancers. However, because many of these are attributable to HPV-16, the HPV vaccine is likely to offer protection against these cancers as well. So um, HPV vaccine is routinely recommended for adolescents at age 11 or 12 years. For girls and boys, starting the, recommendation, started, starting the um, vaccination series before the 15th birthday, the recommended schedule is two doses of HPV vaccine. The second dose should be given six to 12 months after the first dose. Um, ACIP, uh, it also recommends vaccination for females through age 26 years and for males through age 21 years who were not adequately vaccinated previously. Males age 20 through, 22 through 26 years may be vaccinated. So the new recommendations for HPV vaccine dosing schedules are uh, for person, persons initiating vaccination before the 15th birthday, the recommended immunization schedule is two doses of HPV vaccine. The second dose should be administered six to 12 months after the first dose uh, for a zero six to 12 month schedule. For persons initiating vaccination on or after the 15th birthday, the recommendation for a three dose schedule remains. The second dose should be administered one to two months after the first dose, and the third dose should be administered six months after the first dose. For persons who initiated vaccination with nine-valent, quadrivalent, or bivalent HPV vaccine before their 15th birthday and received two doses of any HPV vaccine at the recommended dosing schedule, zero, six to 12 months, or three doses of any HPV vaccine at the recommended dosing schedule, zero, one, to two and six months are considered adequately vaccinated. Persons who initiated vaccination with nine-valent, quadrivalent, or bivalent HPV vaccine on or after their 15th birthday and received three doses of any HPV vaccine at the recommended dosing schedule are considered adequately vaccinated. Nine-valent HPV vaccine may be used to continue or complete a vaccination series started with quadrivalent or bivalent HPV vaccine. For persons who have been adequately vaccinated with quadrivalent or bivalent HPV vaccine, there is no ACIP recommendation regarding additional vaccination with nine-valent HPV vaccine. So that's the very uh, detailed technical information. And this decision tree uh, is an aid to help vaccine providers vaccinate consistent with current recommendations. You can find that decision tree on the cdc.gov under our HPV page.
So to recap, the HPV vaccine recommendations uh, for both boys and girls can start um, at age nine. Ideally, preteens should finish the series by their 13th birthday. Girls aged 13 to 26 years old and boys aged 13 to 21 years old who haven't started or finished HPV vaccine series should also be vaccinated. In short, uh, the HPV vaccine is safe, effective, and provides lasting protection against the types of HPV that most commonly cause cancer. So this next section um, is really focused on strategies to improve HPV vaccine recommendations and framing the conversation with, with uh, patients and their parents. So as you can see in this chart, the rates of first and third dose of HPV vaccine are not nearly as high as the coverage rates for the other vaccines routinely recommended for 11 and 12 year olds. But the very important piece of information that this slide provides is that the strong coverage rates for Tdap vaccine demonstrate that not only are most preteens and teens getting to the doctor, but they also are getting at least one of the recommended adolescent vaccines. So it's a missed clinical opportunity um, um, for HPV vaccination uh, is, defi is defined as a healthcare encounter when some but not all ASIC recommended vaccines are given. So had the HPV vaccine been administered during healthcare visits when another vaccine was administered, vaccination coverage for at least one dose could have reached over 91% by age 13 years for adolescent girls born in 2000. High HPV vaccination coverage with existing infrastructure and healthcare utilization is possible in the U.S., taking advantage of every healthcare encounter, um, including acute care visits, to assess every adolescent's vaccination status can help minimize those missed opportunities. Um, some potential strategies could include using vaccination prompts available through electronic health records or checking local and state immunization information systems to assess vaccination needs at every encounter. I know here in the state, um, the immunization program does have this information through MTRAC. Um, series completion also can be promoted through scheduling appointments for second and third doses before patients leave providers' offices after receipt, after receipt of their first HPV vaccine doses and with automated reminder recall systems. So studies consistently show that a strong recommendation from a healthcare provider is the single best predictor of vaccination for any vaccine, including HPV vaccine. Um, so in the, in the 2014 NIS teen study, nearly 15% of parents who said that they would not be getting their child vaccinated against HPV in the next 12 months identified not receiving a recommendation as one of the top reasons not to vaccinate. So that really begs the question, what is an effective recommendation for HPV vaccination? So you could say something like, now that Sophia is 11, she is due for three vaccines. These will help protect her from meningitis, HPV cancers, and pertussis. We'll give those shots at the end of the visit. Some of you may feel more comfortable with saying a bit more about each of the vaccines being recommended. Um, another way you could make that bubbled recommendation is you could say, now that your child is 11 or 12, she's due today for three important vaccines. The first is to help prevent an infection that can cause meningitis, which is very rare but potentially deadly. The second is to prevent a very common infection, HPV, that can cause several kinds of cancer. The third is the tetanus booster, which also protects against pertussis, so your child doesn't get whooping cough, but also to protect babies too young to be vaccinated. We'll give those shots at the end of the visit. Do you have any questions? Um, many parents will accept the bundled recommendation without any questions, and other parents may be interested in vaccinating, yet may still have questions for you. Uh, a question from a parent about HPV vaccine does not mean they are refusing or delaying. Many parents with questions about HPV vaccine are looking for additional reassurance from their provider. Um, taking the time to listen, listen to parents' questions can help save time and give an effective response. So just be sure to verify that you're addressing the right concerns. Um, it is hard for parents to see uh, or consider their 11 or 12-year-old as being at risk for HPV infection, and they may ask about that risk. So 
focus on how common HPV is and how they can protect their child from cancer by saying something like HPV is a very common and widespread virus that infects both females and males. So we can help protect your child from the cancers and diseases caused by the virus by starting HPV vaccination today. Asking why now or why at 11 or 12 is another way that parents may say that they think their child is too young for quote unquote that kind of behavior, in other words, sexual activity. Help parents understand the importance of vaccination before exposure and that we don't wait for exposure to occur or guess when it will occur before vaccinating. So most people are familiar with and endorse the use of bicycle helmets. For example, you could also use seat belts as an example. Um, maybe ask a parent, when do you want your children to put on their bike helmet? Make the point that we can't guess when the bike accident risk may occur, so we always have our children put on their helmets before getting on their bikes. Or you could just say, as with all vaccine-preventable diseases, we want to protect your child early. If we start now, it's one less thing for you to worry about. Also, your child will only need two shots of HPV vaccine at this age. If you wait until 15, your child will need three shots. We'll give the first shot today, and then you'll need to bring your child back in six to 12 months from now for the second shot. So there are some parents who will continue to bring concerns about um, sexual disinhibition following vaccination. So you can reassure these parents that numerous research studies have shown that getting the HPV vaccine does not make kids more likely to be sexually active or start having sex at a younger age. Starting the HPV vaccine series today will give your child the best protection possible for the future. So the new two-dose recommendation may cause some parents to think that they can wait another year or three. So you can tell these parents, the two-dose schedule is recommended if the series is started before the 15th birthday. However, I don't recommend waiting to give this cancer-preventing vaccine. As children get older and have busier schedules, it becomes more difficult to get them back in. I'd feel best if we started the series today to get your child protected as soon as possible. Naturally, some parents will have questions about HPV vaccine safety. They may have heard something or read something online that makes them concerned. So you could start with something like, it sounds like you are generally in support of vaccines, but you have concerns about the safety of HPV. Is that right? So if you had information that convinced you the HPV vaccine was safe, you might consider letting your daughter or son get it. I'd like to share with you what I know about the safety of HPV vaccine and then share that specific information with them. It's important to acknowledge a parent's concerns. Try saying something like, I know there are stories in the media and online about vaccines and I can see how that could concern you. However, I want you to know the HPV vaccine has been carefully studied for many years by medical and scientific experts. Based on all of the data, I believe HPV vaccine is very safe. So if safety concerns are specific to adverse events, um, explain to parents that vaccines, like any medication, can cause side effects. With HPV vaccination, this, should, this could include pain, swelling, and or redness where the shot is given or possibly headache. Sometimes kids faint when they get shots and they could be injured if they fall from the fainting. We'll protect your child by having them stay seated after the shot. Sometimes vaccine safety questions can be very specific. If you get questions about other specific safety concerns, such as death, neurologic conditions, autoimmune conditions, venous thromboembolism, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or complex regional pain syndrome, you can say HPV vaccine safety studies have been very reassuring, and to date we have not observed any signal that shows that HPV vaccination causes that particular health problem. So parents may also voice concerns about vaccine effectiveness. How do you know if it works? You can let parents know that ongoing studies are showing that HPV vaccination works very well and has decreased HPV infection, genital warts, and cervical precancers in young people in the years since it has been available. Starting the vaccine series today will help ensure your child gets the best protection possible. So as I mentioned previously, many parents are not aware of HPV disease in men and may ask why their male child needs to be vaccinated. It's important for parents to know that HPV infection causes cancer in men as well. You can say something like HPV infection can cause cancers of the penis, anus, and throat in men, and it can also cause genital warts. 
Getting HPV vaccine today for your son can help prevent the infection that can lead to these diseases. So occasionally parents um, will ask you if, uh, you know, why they should get this particular vaccine if it's not required for school. So it's important to explain the difference between a recommendation that you are making for the health of your child versus a legislative decision that is designed to keep kids who may have missed a vaccination from slipping through the cracks. Letting parents know that you, along with CDC and the major medical societies, recommend all of the vaccines equally for their child's health um, and can help them understand that HPV vaccination is a normal part of adolescent health. You can share with them that school entry requirements don't always reflect the current recommendations for their child's health. So sometimes parents may want to know if you or one of your colleagues um, would give the HPV vaccine to your own kids. So if you've vaccinated your child, you can share that with parents by saying something to the effect of, yes, I have given HPV vaccine to my child because I believe in the importance of this cancer-preventing vaccine. You can also tell them that the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Cancer Society, NIH cancer centers and the CDC also agree that getting the HPV vaccine is very important for your child. So um, the other question is, you know, when should they come back? A recent study highlighted the need for parents to be told when they need to bring their child in for the remaining doses. Most parents do not know how many shots are in the series or what the intervals are. So if your child is younger than 15, she'll need a second shot in six months when you check out please make sure to schedule an appointment for the second shot and put that appointment on your calendar before you leave today. Um, if your child's already 15, uh, tell the parents um, they'll need a second dose in one to two months. The third dose will be due in six months from today. When you check out, please make sure to make an appointment for about six weeks from now and six months from now and put those appointments on your calendar before you leave. Some parents may have additional questions about the new dosing schedule. Try saying the recommended schedule is two shots given six to 12 months apart. The minimum amount of time between those shots is five months. Because your child received two shots less than five months apart, we'll need to give your child a third shot. So now that we've covered the basics, I'm going to briefly review what the American Cancer Society is doing in support of increasing HPV vaccination and preventing HPV-related cancers. HPV is going to be launching a camp, or ACS is going to be launching a campaign called Mission HPV Cancer Free this summer. We have partners who want to help, um, who are asking, what can we do? How do we share the great work we're already doing? Um, based on the on the science, we at ACF are adopting five key strategies I will outline next. Uh, as we've already discussed, the biggest predictor of HPV vaccination uptake is an effective recommendation from a healthcare professional. So we're partnering with providers and health systems to make sure that healthcare professionals are making a strong, effective recommendation. So here's an example of one of the many resources that we use within a clinical system to help support HPV vaccination efforts. Uh, this steps for increasing HPV vaccination in practice is an eight-page action guide. Um, it's got a toolkit um, roadmap on exactly how to increase vaccination. Uh, it was launched a few years ago, and it's been tested and improved um, in pilot testing with over 80 federally qualified health care clinic level intervention projects. Um, the next strategy is activating partners and stakeholders. Each state, community, and jurisdiction has its own set of challenges, opportunities, and systems to tackle to improve HPV vaccination rates. In many states, forming key stakeholder groups, such as the State HPV Vaccination Roundtable or Coalition, is integral to improving rates. Um, regardless of whether a state group is a formal roundtable or an informal coalition, there are key members that should be working together. So here in Montana, I can tell you there are already a lot of partners working together um, at the state level, including um, um, the state immunization program, um, area health education centers, um, and uh, lots of other partners that I can't name right now, but I know um, are all actively involved in HPV immunization efforts. 
The third strategy is really to know your data and track your progress. Um, ACS Health System staff, that would be here in Montana, uh, myself and Cheryl Stewart, can help with understanding HPV data. Um, I know that uh, at the state level, Carolyn Perry is also a great resource for you. Uh, whether at a clinic, county, or state level, data can really help drive your planning and intervention process. The fourth strategy is implementing evidence-based interventions and systems changes. Targeted interventions are needed to ensure timely progress. Systems changes should be made as necessary to support and sustain HPV vaccination interventions. Evidence-based interventions for HPV vaccination include patient reminders, provider EHR alerts, standing orders, provider feedback reports, and policy changes. And of course, uh, our number one message is that HPV vaccination is cancer prevention. Communicating this message within our organization, externally, with parents, and with our partners and stakeholders will really help all of us make HPV cancer history. So there's a big role both for um, people within health systems and public health and, you know, people who work in the community to be a part of, you know, a really wraparound, all-encompassing approach to increasing awareness and vaccination. So June 8, uh, 2026 will mark 20 years since the original FDA approval of the first HPV vaccine in the United States. The American Cancer Society will be using June 8th as an annual touch point and will be launching the external campaign the week of June 8th, 2018. As an annual touch point, this date will be used to report on ACS's progress towards our 2026 coverage goal. We do have a promotional kit for this week, um, for, for this, this week and we'll, that will be available uh, for your use. Just feel free to reach out to me. So what will the week of June 8th include? So really it's a chance for us to, to stand with our partners uh, and share the amazing opportunity we have to eliminate multiple forms of cancer through vaccination. This week we'll also launch a public advertising campaign that will run through the summer in key markets where we know vaccination rates are low. So what are we asking you to do? Um, partners, volunteers, champions, anybody working in this field, we're really asking um, for you to stand with us on this week and share what you're doing or plan to do to create a work, a world that is HPV cancer free. So to wrap this up, HPV vaccine is cancer prevention and each one of you are the key to helping stop HPV. And that's all I have. So if anyone has questions, you can type them in the chat box. And then I'll also, here I'll put it in the chat box right now, we're going to post a recording at this website. And then Emily, do you want to put in your um, email for questions? If you yep. want to contact you later. Perfect. Oh, there's one right there. So it says, do you know if there's a disparity between trans cis people when it comes to HPV infection and or treatment? And if there is, how is this being addressed? That's a great question. and. I, we have just developed a lot of, I, I don't know the answer to it. Um, we are in the process of developing a lot of materials through ACS right now, and I can put a request out to our HPV vaccination team to see if they have the answer to that, um, Matt, and also if there's any plans for that being addressed. Um, if that would be helpful, I can, I can do some outreach and see if, if either any of the folks at ACS or the CDC have investigated that, that particular topic yet. You're welcome. Any other questions?
Okay, wonderful. Well, if you have any further questions, um, Emily's email is above. And um, I know you had mentioned the toolkit, the eight-page guide, too, if anyone's interested in that. Um, so thank you so much, Emily. This is very informative. Thank you very much. And feel free to reach out with any questions. Perfect. Okay, and remember to take the survey at the end. Thank you, everyone.